little series today, it's just a two-parter, and I'm calling it When the Tough Gets Going. Now, don't mishear that, when the tough gets going. Not to be confused with this worldly expression, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Well, my question is, who are those tough people? Anyway, I don't know any of them. I'm looking around the room, I don't see any tough guys. Look pretty soft to me. Just, just saying, no offense. And uh, you know, don't feel bad about that because the tough don't inherit the world. They don't inherit the earth. Who inherits the earth? Yeah, the meek shall inherit the earth, so we don't need to be tough guys. You remember growing up, you know who the tough guys were, don't you? They were the bullies. They were the bullies. They were the ones that made the tough get going in your life. They were the ones that made, you know, it went like this. When the going gets tough, the not so tough ran away. And I was one of those guys. You probably were too. Now, I know you look at me today. I know. I understand this. You look at me and you say, but Pastor Mark, you're, you're, you're super cut and you're buff and you're ripped and you're jacked. And, and yeah, I know. But I'm, at, at heart, I'm really not a tough guy. I'm a Georgie boy. You, how many of you remember Georgie Porgy put in pie, kissed the girls and made them cry. And when the boys came out to play, Georgie Porgy ran away. And that's more like what I'm like. So I got to tell you this story. So last night... Uh, Kathy and I had a battle royal. I mean, we just threw it down. It was a tough one. And I, don't, I didn't know how this was going to end. And well, we finally resolved it when Kathy came to me crawling on her hands and knees. Yeah, and she said, come out from under that bed and fight like a man. <laughs> That's how that went. <laughs> so I'm going to share with you today a principle none of you are going to like. And in fact, when I share it, you're going to at first reject it, and then you're going to think about it, and you go, you know, it's actually true. I don't want it to be true. I don't want to believe it's true, but it's probably true. And here's the principle. Are you ready for it? It's this. Things usually get worse before they get better. And if you think about that, you'll realize that's actually true. And it's actually been proven. They've done research on this. And you know, when there's a little you know, dip in the road, we think, OK, that was a little dip in the road. Now things are going to get better. Usually not. Usually there's a bigger dip after the first dip and another dip after that dip. And any of you that you know involved with the stock market know that that's true. Whenever the stock market corrects, it rarely just goes back up again. It goes through what they call the Elliott wave theory and usually three waves down before it starts growing up. Things get worse before they get better. And if you don't believe me, I'll give you a little example you can all relate to. So you live in a house, you live in an apartment, wherever you live. And let's say you're thinking, I want my place to look better. That's where you want it to go. And so you think, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start by slapping a coat of paint on the living room, right? We always say it like it's so easy. Just slap a coat of paint on the living room and it's going to look better, right? So then you start into it. What do you have to do? You have to move all your furniture and you have to cover all your furniture. And then you have to start taking down the shelves and taking off the pictures. And then you realize the furniture has been banging up the walls and there's holes behind the pictures that you put the picture there to hide in the first place. And so then you have to start doing this repair work. And so you're starting to tape up that and then you have to sand it and then the, the dust is getting all over the place and they used to have to prime it and then you prime it you're a terrible painter so now you got it all over the floor and you got to clean up the floor and you, and you stand back you're ready to go to bed you haven't started painting yet and you look at this and you thought this looks worse right it had to get worse you all know what i'm talking about before it got better now eventually it's going to look better but you got to go through worse to get to better and probably every handyman in the room has done this where your wife says go fix the faucet and you made it worse before the plumber came to make it better, <laughs> right? And so we, we all know what we're talking about. And when you go into scripture, you actually see this in startling ways. And I think the most profound example of that is the story of Job. Now, I've discovered that nobody's actually ever read the story of Job. It's way too long, way too depressing. Most people don't read it. 40 chapters of that kind of stuff, I'm not going to read it. So you don't have to. I'm going to tell you a story. Or you can go read this book. It's the Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Same story. <laughs> Same story. And what it is, it's when things go from bad to worse to worse. And that's what it's about. And the story of Job is such. So let me tell you about Job's terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. So it began like this. There were some Sabian raiders, and they came in, and they stole his donkeys, and they, he, they stole his oxen, and they killed his farmhands. And then there was a fire, and the fire killed all his sheep and killed all his shepherds. And then some Chaldean raiders came in, and they stole the camels, and they killed all of 
Job's servants. Then there was a big windstorm, and the windstorm caused the house to collapse where his ten children were having dinner, and every last one of them were killed. This is going from bad to worse. And then Job was struck with painful boils that lasted nine months of absolute misery, and the only thing, he lost everything, and the only thing he had left was his three unhelpful friends and one grumpy wife. Now, the only conclusion I can come to was him keeping his wife was worse than losing her. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. That's <laughs> just sort of the way I'm looking at it, because she was like super grumpy, and who would want to be married to her? But anyway, we find this story. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Sometimes I just have to amuse myself, so there you go. And so anyway, things got worse and worse and worse and worse. Now, did it ever turn around? Yeah, yeah, it got worse before it got better, and eventually it turned around. It takes forever. You have to read through 39 chapters of Job before you get to chapter 40, where the thing turns around, and then what did God do? God gave him double everything he had. Twice as many camels, and twice as many oxen, and twice as many sheep, and twice as many servants, and 10 more children. Why didn't he give him 20? <laughs> Seriously, who wants 20 children? <laughs> I don't know, he gave him 10. And so we see God restore to him that which is lost. And I know none of us like this story. Who likes the story of Job? And I know you scratch your head and you think, you know, God was protecting him and removed the hedge of protection. What was it? Some sort of like thing, some special dispensation where it was open season on Job? The answer to that would be yes, but there's nothing special about it. I've got news for you. You're not going to like this. It's open season on everyone. Go read 1 Peter. Peter says this. He said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And this is one of the most difficult things for us to understand. Why do we have hardship in this world? I remember the theologian R.C. Sproul, he once had someone come to him and ask him this question. And they said, why do bad things happen to good people? To which he said, I wouldn't know. I don't know any good people. <laughs> That's about as good an answer as you can get. But isn't that the big objection people have to our faith? The big objection they have is why if God is good, why is there evil in the world? Why is it, if God is good, why do bad things happen to good people? It's a fair question. And my intent is not to answer that question, except to give you a very cursory answer, and that is this, that we live in the dynamic tension between good and evil. We live in a fallen world, and there is God and there is the devil, and whether we like it or not, we will have trouble in this world. It exists in our world, and it's not a matter of whether we can avoid the trouble. You won't. It's what are we going to do in the midst of it? Are we going to have the courage and the strength and the faith to press on through it? And that's what I'm here to talk about, when the tough gets going. I know what some of you are thinking. You're saying, Pastor Mark, I'm not liking this message so far. Well, don't worry. It's only going to get worse <laughs> before it gets better. So I have a verse I want to share with you. It's, it's Psalm 34. I'll throw it up on the screen. You know this verse. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. So let's workshop this verse for a moment. First of all, you're going to have to answer these questions. Number one, who are the righteous? <laughs> I love it that nobody knows that. I don't know who they are. Let me ask you again. Who are the righteous? Yes, it's supposed to be you people. I know you don't feel like it. I know, you, I know you don't look like it. I know you don't act like it. But guess what? You're the righteous. So that's where we start. All right. How many are your afflictions? Many. <laughs> many. Many. It's not numbered, but it's a lot. Third question. How many will the Lord deliver you out of? Oh. And the Lord will deliver him out of them all. See, this is the thing that we need to remember, that we live in challenging days and a challenging world, and it's just the way God made it, whether you like it or don't like it, and the scripture promises you trouble. In fact, this is what uh, uh, the, the way Jesus put it, Jesus told us, as he said, you will have tribulation in this world. Now, that's a good one. Right? You like that one? But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So we do have reason to cheer in the midst of that. And I remember I always preach on that. I say, Jesus said you will have tribulation in this world. Nobody's got that up on their refrigerator as a verse. 
And then some guy sends me an email with a picture of his refrigerator, and he had that verse up on his fridge. So I e emailed him back. I said, you're weird. <laughs> that was probably not the right thing to say, but it seemed funny at the time. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at this verse. It's very famous. You know it very well. But I'm telling you, it is the most instructive passage you will ever read on how to overcome difficult times. And it's in the book of James. James, we know, by the way, was the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus, biological brother. And this isn't James from his disciples. This isn't that James. He was killed in the book of Acts. And his brother James went on to become this eminent apostle, and he wrote this incredible book that is really like no other book in Scripture. James says things you will not read anywhere else. He had an insight and an intuition into how to struggle, struggle through the varieties, varieties and uh, struggles of life. And we're going to look at this and uh, we'll learn a lot from it. So James chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So he starts off by saying this. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, you all do that already, right? No, nobody does that. I don't know anybody that does this. How many people count a joy when they fall into trials? You break your leg. Woohoo! I broke my leg. How good is that? I lost my job. Woohoo! I'm unemployed. You lose your house. Woohoo! Fantastic. Your wife leaves you. Oh, never mind. Never. I, I said I was going to leave the wife jokes alone, didn't I? So I'm done with that. But we, we don't do this. And so we need to dig into this a little deeper. We're going to have to do a deep dive, find out why does he think this? What does he know that we don't know? So here it is. Here is what we do when the tough gets going. I'm going to throw it up on the screen. Three things. Number one, embrace adversity. Number two, exercise patience. Number three, engage faith. So we start with this, that we're going to embrace adversity. Think about this. Nobody ever teaches that. Do you know anybody that teaches that we embrace adversity? We have people that teach you should resist adversity. You should endure it through adversity. You should persevere through adversity. But nobody tells you that you should actually embrace it except for James. And James says, count it all joy. There's a reason why you're in it and you need to embrace it. Now, I didn't say to surrender to it and be defeated by it. That's not what I said. I said, embrace the journey as something that is there for a bigger purpose. Now, how many remember Ann Landers, the advice columnist in the paper years ago? How many old enough? Young people won't remember this, but she was one of the most famous advice columnists of all time. And she gave, she left this world with one singular piece of advice that she said it was her greatest uh, ubiquitous advice. And so here it is. I'm going to throw it up on the screen. If I were asked to give what I consider the single most useful bit of advice for all humanity, it would be this. Expect trouble as an inevitable part of life. Look it squarely in the eye and say, I will be bigger than you. You can't not defeat me. And so her point was this. Is you're going to have to embrace adversity because it's going to come. It's part of life. It's inevitable. And you don't have to be defeated by it, but you have to expect it and you're going to have to decide how you are going to deal with it. So when we look into scripture, we have another guy, also a J name. His name was Joseph. And he had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. And you'll remember how it all started. So Joseph was the second youngest of 12 children to Jacob. And he had a dream one night. And in the dream, there was these sheaves. And they were bowing down to his sheave. And he interpreted it correctly, by the way, as his 12 brothers or 11 brothers and his mother and father bowing down to him. Well, he was very excited about that and thought he would share that dream with his brothers. <laughs> Not always a good idea to share your dreams, especially with your brothers. <laughs> anyway, so they weren't nearly as excited about it as he was. <laughs> you remember the story. So here's how it played out. First of all, they said, I got an idea. Let's kill him. And so they took him and they threw him in a pit. 
and the idea was a lion was going to come and, and eat him, and that'd be OK. And then someone said, ah, maybe we shouldn't throw him into a pit. Why don't we sell him? So I, I, to me, this story seems like it's getting worse. But anyway, he, so he got sold off to slave traders. And then the slave traders actually sold him into slavery into Egypt. And then while he was a slave in Egypt, he ended up in this incident where he got falsely accused of raping Potiphar's wife, his master's wife, and he ends up in prison. So I don't know if you've been following the progression here. It's not going towards better so far. It is getting worse and worse and worse. And now he finds himself in prison. Pretty sure they didn't have color TVs and lazy boys and Wi-Fi service. I'm pretty sure in that day it was some sort of dark, dingy dungeon. And there he was. And here's what's amazing to me is what the, the Lord says about him while he's a slave in Egypt. It's Genesis chapter 39, verse 2, if you want to go look it up. It said this, and the Lord was with Joseph, and he became a very successful man. He was a successful man. Don't ignore the fact that he was a slave. And then a number of verses later, we find him in prison, and the Lord speaks up again and says, and the Lord was with Joseph, and everything he did, the Lord made to prosper. I <laughs> mean, He's in a dungeon. How, how prosperous can you be? Well, as prosperous as you can be in a dungeon. That's how prosperous he was. Here's what I don't want you to miss. That he embraced his adversity wherever he was, the Lord was with him, and he became the best person that he could be in every situation. Why? Because the Lord was with him. And that's the journey that each and, and every one of us are on. We're in this journey where we're having to deal with the difficulties and the challenges of life. And the big question is, what are we going to do? How are we going to handle it? How are we going to get through it? So I want to tell you a little story. First of all, let me ask you this. Uh, how many, any soccer players in the room? Any soccer? Or fans, soccer fans. Any soccer fans in the room? We've got a few soccer fans, not a bunch. Uh, how many of you have seen, you probably haven't because there wasn't very many hands up. Uh, how many of you have seen the Netflix documentary Beckham on David Beckham? Anybody seen this? A couple of people have seen this. And uh, there it is. It, it it's recently came out. And I was pretty excited to watch it because the story of David Beckham and Manchester United was something that my kids grew up with. I had a tier one level soccer player son. Every Saturday morning, we watched English Premier Soccer. And so this story and the characters in this story was all something we were really familiar with. So we watched all four parts. And it was very, very interesting to me. So let me tell you just quickly the story, if you don't know it. So David Beckham got recruited by Manchester United, English team in Manchester, of course, uh, when he was 12 years old. And the, the coach, or they call him manager, was Sir Alex Ferguson. And he brought him into the dressing room at 12 years old, and he was grooming him for the team. At 17 years old, he starts playing premier soccer in England. And by 23 years old, he's a superstar. He's an absolute superstar. But then life got even better for him because he married Victoria Adams. And who was that? Anybody know? Yeah, more people who know who that is than David Beckham. And, and that, that, of course, was Posh, Posh Spice, one of the Spice Girls. And when these two got married, they actually became the most famous couple in the world. If there was royalty in England, it wasn't Charles and Diana. <laughs> it was these two. And he was the Brill Cream guy. You can see he's got great hair. Still does. And uh, he had these huge contracts. And he was making millions of dollars. And he married a Spice Girl. And the media couldn't get enough of him. And, and his, his, his star could not have been rising any higher than this. And then what happens, 1998, he gets invited to play on the England World Cup team, the team that is qualifying for the World Cup. Biggest thing in soccer, once every four years. And they're in a qualifying game against the country of Argentina. He's on the field, and he ends up in a little melee with uh, Diego Simeone. And Diego Simeone was a player for uh, Argentina. Here's the picture here. Beckham is down on the ground, and here's what happened is he flicks his heel up like that, trying to hit him. He just flicks it up when he's lying in the ground. He's not even looking. You can see he's not even looking. He misses, or perhaps he maybe grazes Diego's leg. But as they do in soccer, he does a huge dive. And we see him throwing himself backwards and clutching his leg in absolute pain. He later admitted that he didn't even hit him, and he was acting the whole time. 
The ref walks over and flashes Beckham a red card. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with this, the uninitiated, the red card is not a warning, it's an ejection from the game. Not only are you ejected from the game, but your team is now playing one player short. And so instead of 11 on the pitch, you're now playing 10 on the pitch. And so the team went on to lose to Argentina and their hopes of the World Cup were dashed and over. The coach, which was not Alex Ferguson, because this was the English coach, he threw Beckham under the bus. He blamed the whole loss on, on Beckham, uh, even though he didn't even actually deserve that red card, but that's what happened, and that's soccer sometimes. And anyway, what happened was incredible because the entire nation of England turned against him. And he became the most hated man in England. Everybody hated them. The tablets wrote stuff like this. 10 heroic lions, one stupid boy. And they thrashed him and bashed him and there was death threats against him and his, and his wife had death threats against her and they couldn't go out anywhere in public. And if they did, people would spit on them and swear at them and curse at them. And then the team rallied around him and Manchester United and, and Alex Ferguson, they said, we will stand with you and we will protect you. But they couldn't protect him from the hatred of a whole country. Now understand this about England. Soccer is not a sport. It is a religion, a fervent, hysterical religion. And if you ever have been to an English premier game, I encourage you to go, I've been, and it is a sight to behold. But nevertheless, they hated him. So every time he came onto the field, every time they would boo him. Every single game, every opposing team, they would boo him and boo him. And if he'd make a bad play, they would boo him. If he made a good play, they booed him. And this went on for the entire year. And he went through the most difficult and challenging time of his life, not just uh, career-wise, but personally and relationally, and just dreadful. The, the documentary does a beautiful job of illustrating this. And he could, have, he could have folded like a cheap lawn chair, but he decided he was gonna embrace the adversity. And he was going to push through it no matter what happened. He was going to keep on pressing through it. And this is what happened. Every time they booed him, he played harder. And every time they booed him, he played better. And he went on to have his best year of his entire career. Manchester United went on to have this, their best career, sorry, year of their history. And they won what was called a treble. Now a treble is when you win your league and the next league up and the final league beyond that. So in their case, they first of all, uh, they won the English Premier League, then they won the FA Cup, which is all the British teams together, and then they won the Champions League, which is all of Europe. And there no, had, at that point, no other English team had never succeeded to do this, but the most hated man in England led their team to, team to this. So after a year, his fortunes turned. Things got worse before they got better. I'm hoping you're catching that. And he actually went and rose to new heights once again. In 2002, he once again makes the World Cup qualifying team, and guess who they made captain? David Beckham in 2006 as well. That uh, armband it signifies that he is the captain of the team. Now, understand something. I'm not a huge, huge fan of David Beckham personally. I find him self-absorbed and narcissistic, but I love this story. I love this story because this is what happens when people embrace adversity. There is nothing that can drag you down. You following this? All right, so the first thing is to embrace the adversity. The second thing is to exercise patience. So once again, James says this, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, spelt wrong, nothing, and, uh, but let patience have its perfect work. Why is patience so important? Well, and you look into scripture, you'll discover one thing. Well, you'll discover a few things, but you'll discover this, that you know most of the time God's promises do not come instantly. We would like them to. Let's talk about Joseph for a moment. He had a promise that actually was of the Lord, that one day his brothers and his parents were gonna bow down to him. Then they sold him off as a slave. Things went from worse to worse, like I said. And it was 13 years before he finally got out of prison and rose to the place of the prime minister in all of Egypt. 
second man only to the Pharaoh himself. And then it was another nine years before his family actually showed up, not recognizing him, bowing down and asking for help in the midst of the famine. Do the math, that is 22 years, more than half of his entire life, waiting for the promise to come to pass. You see, here's one of the challenges we have, and you know, don't, don't take this the wrong way, but I think sometimes Jesus is a bad example for us. You say, well, why would you say that? Well, no, he's a great example, but there are certain, there's one thing that it's sort of a bad example for us, and it's this, is that when Jesus prayed, he almost always got his answer instantly. Remember that? He prayed, someone was healed. Prayed, someone was rose, risen from the dead. And so we think, well, that's how it should go for us. The problem is it's not going to go like that for you. And I know you say, well, Pastor Mark, why is it when Jesus prayed, he got the answer immediately, and I didn't? You want to know the answer to that? Because he's Jesus and you're not. Yeah, aren't you glad you come to church where I can explain stuff like this to you? And he was in a hurry. He only had three and a half years to get her all done. You got the rest of your life. And that's why he said men ought, ought always to pray and not lose heart. Why would he say that? He would say that because you're not going to get the answer immediately. And here's my advice to you. You know what you don't want to be? You don't want to be Pop-Tart pop Christians. Huh? What's a Pop-Tart? Pop-Tart is a nutritious breakfast that is made almost instantly. Delicious and nutritious, right? Actually, Jerry, Jerry Seinfeld says this, I love it. He says, the Pop-Tart is a, a frosted fruit-filled square, the same size and shape as the box with the same nutritional value. It can't go stale because it wasn't fresh to begin with. But here's, here's what's interesting about the Pop-Tart, and I'm going somewhere with this. The Pop-Tart is the in, basically the instant breakfast. It doesn't get more instant than this. And if you buy a Pop-Tart, and I, I, don't tell me you've never had one, because you've all had one at one point or another, even as an experiment. And if you look at the box, it gives the directions. And to toast a Pop-Tart, this, this is my favorite part, the directions for toasting the Pop-Tart is three steps. Who is this clientele that needs to be explained how to toast a Pop-Tart? And you know what step one is? Remove Pop-Tart from the pouch, just in case you accidentally toast it in the plastic pouch, right? I mean, this says everything about the particular consumer we're talking about here. So, but that's not what I want to talk about, because if you toast the Pop-Tart, it takes a very long time. It takes one to one and a half minutes, and who's got that kind of time? So you can go to option two, which is the microwave cooking option, which also is three steps. I don't have time to share all three steps with you. Let me share step two. Step two is microwave on high setting for three seconds. Three seconds. If you need to make breakfast in three seconds, you're scheduling your day too tight. That's what I have. That's my advice to you. I mean, who only has three seconds to have breakfast? And so anyway, I decided to do an experiment and see if you really could cook it in three seconds. The answer is, you can't. It's still frozen solid. But because of liability reasons, they don't want you to burn it your tongue, so you have to eat it frozen after three seconds. You say, Pastor Mark, what on earth are you talking about? Pop-Tarts, what are you talking about? And I'm talking about Pop-Tart faith. I'm talking about the fact that people want the answers to their prayers like right now. And James said, but patience, let patience have its perfect work. Do you really want to be a Pop-Tart? Do you want to go through life as a Pop-Tart? You do not. You do not. And the problem is you listen to the televangelists. Boy, they want to create Pop-Tart Christians. That's what they want to do. Don't you hate those televangelists? Don't ever be a televangelist. They're the worst. You caught the irony there, right? <laughs> People call me one of those. Anyway, they are the worst. And, and you know, they, they, they teach you this, they teach you these messages that you have no troubles in life and all you need is faith in God. And if you'll just say it and confess it and whatever, it'll happen. And you can have your best life now. Really? You can have your best life now? If you take that to its logical conclusion, that means that you're going to hell for your next life if you're having your best life now. Yeah, you can think about that. That's just the way my little brain thinks. And so when we, when we look at this thing called patience, we're not very good at it. Let's be honest about it. Lord, give me patience and give it to me now, right? That's how we pray. So I want to tell you a story about patience and a man who has succeeded tremendously in life with a very difficult start. And his name was Tom. He was born in Iowa 
uh, or Ohio rather, got that wrong. He was born in Ohio to an unemployed father. He had difficulties right from the get-go. He had an IQ of 81, 100 being average. Uh, he struggled in school. Not only did he struggle in school, he got scarlet fever. He was pulled out of school for two years, went back to school, and he was failing. So his parents pulled him out of school, tried to homeschool him, did not do very well. He had behavioral problems. He was stubborn. He was aloof. He showed little emotion. If he was alive today, they would probably diagnose him on the autism spectrum. You know how that works. And so then life got even worse for him, and he went and burned down the barn. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of was the straw that broke the camel's back. And so they sent him out. And if that weren't bad enough, he started to go deaf. And his hearing was very bad. And he got a job at, on the railway running the telegraph machine. And the one thing he could hear was the clicks of the telegraph. That was the one thing he could hear clearly, even though his hearing wasn't very good. And so he was doing the telegraph. He was 15 years old at the time. And he thought, there's a better way for this machine to work. And he tweaked the machine, and he improved on it. And the railway was thrilled. And they sent him to New York City. And he went to the New York Stock Exchange. And he improved the stock ticker in the New York Stock Exchange. So much so that they paid him a handsome sum in that day of $40,000, which was more money than people made in a lifetime, practically, in that particular day. And then he went on and he invented this other thing, and it was called the phonograph. And, and his first song that he recorded was Mary Had a Little Lamp. And then he took a camera and he figured out a way to turn it into a motion picture camera. And then he bought this, this uh, invention. It was a Canadian patent, actually, by a guy named Woodward. And he went and he tweaked it, and he got the filament to quit burning out because it emitted light. And he called it a light bulb. How many people know who I'm talking about right now? I'm talking about Thomas Edison, who has gone down in history as the greatest inventor of all time. At the end of his life, he had 2,332 patents in his name. He invented everything in your kitchen, basically, is what this guy did. And when people called him a genius, this is where it, what you know. When people called him a genius, he rejected that title. And he said this. I'll throw it up on the screen. Genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Hard work and patience. I equally like Yogi Berra, the baseball player, his expression. It was this. Baseball is 90% mental. The other half is physical. <laughs> <laughs> So the first thing is this, you have to embrace the adversity. The second thing is you have to exercise patience. And the last and the final thing is you have to engage faith. So here's what the scripture says. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And what you discover when you read James's stuff is that he always puts faith and patience together. They're inextricably connected. And I call this James secret formula for success, and it's faith plus patience equals results. And faith alone is not going to do it. Patience alone is not going to do it. But you take faith and you take patience and you put them together like James does, and he says, you will be complete, lacking nothing. And so the last part of this is as you're, in, as you're embracing the adversity, as you're exercising patience, you have to engage your faith. And you have to believe that God is going to take you through this no matter what. So I just want to close with one final story to illustrate this. So this week we had a conference here, and we had some, some men here I was very excited to meet. And uh, they were pastors from Ukraine. Their names were Dimitrio and Andre. And uh, they were men that we have been indirectly sponsoring over the last year or so uh, to the tune of tens of thousands of dollars of your money, by the way. I love spending your money. Thank you very much. And uh, you're going to be excited to hear this report from these guys. So these two guys came to our conference this week that we're hosting in the building. I was able to have a time where I had lunch with them because I wanted to ask them some questions. So let me zero in on, on Andre in particular. So I'm going to show you a map of, of, of Russia, so, or of Ukraine, rather. So there's Ukraine, and there's Russia on the right. And everything in the, in the pink, that is all territory in southeast uh, Ukraine that is now controlled by Russia as of the invasion of months, months ago. 
And uh, they have basically taken this whole thing. My friend Andre, I'm gonna call him that, uh, he's from the city of Zaporizhia. And you can see that in the left side of the map there, Zaporizhia. They are 40 kilometers, 40 kilometers from the front where the battle is being fought. They go to sleep every night to the sound of bombs going off all night long. They listen to this. They know that their, their city is probably next. Uh, because I want you to, to look on the map, you see Mariupol. And, and the reason I'm pointing that out to you is you all remember this was the port city. And we watched basically live on television as this city got flattened. And Russia invaded this city and they literally demolished it. Show these pictures of it. This is what the typical building in Mariupol looks like. And if you take an aerial view, 95% of every building in Mariupol is completely demolished. The city is completely wiped out. 325,000 people evacuated from the city before it got wiped out, and the 75,000 that remained uh, were killed, 75,000. And so I asked, I asked Andre and Dimitri this question. I said, how many people have died so far in this conflict? And they told me that over one half a million Ukrainians have already lost their life. Now, there, you know there's rules in war, you know that, right? And you're not allowed to kill civilians, and you're not allowed to bomb hospitals, and you're not allowed to bomb schools, and you're not allowed to kill children, and Putin has done all of that. And how is that not, how is that not genocide? And I know we all wigged out as we should have when Hamas went over the border and killed 1,300 Israelis, but Putin has now killed over a half a million Ukrainians. This is genocide. This is a war crime. There's no other way to put this. And these poor guys are right smack in the middle of it. So then I, I was asking them, I said, how long do you think this war is going to go on? They said, we might live like this for years to come because this doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon. And so then I said, why are you still in Zaporizhia? Because people are evacuating Zaporizhia. They're, they're the next on the line if the Russians make it that far. Why are you still there? He says, because God has put me in that place. And that's where God has called me to be. And, and to your church's help, we can still be there. We're, we're still struggling through this. And let me tell you what's happened to our church since the war began. When we began the war, our church was 50 people. Today, our congregation is 500 people strong. And he says, I'm not running from my city because God has called me to be there. And I'm going to endure through this thing. And God is going to be with us. And God is with us. And then he told me this story is crazy because people are always leaving. Every day, people are getting on the train and they're leaving. Here's a picture. They're getting on the, they're getting on the trains and they're leaving their cities and they're leaving their houses and they're leaving their jobs and they're leaving their families and they're leaving their businesses behind and they literally have nothing except what they could carry and they get on these trains you can see nobody's smiling and what they do is they go down to the train dock and they preach the gospel to these people while they're waiting to get on the train and then they give an invitation and he says virtually every single last one of them invites Christ into their life so he says we have the greatest opportunity we've ever had in the midst of the greatest challenges we've ever faced. You see, that's the message of true faith. When the tough gets going, what do we do? We, number one, we embrace adversity. Number two, we exercise patience. Number three, we engage our faith. And many are the adversities of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver him out of them all. Let's stand together, shall we? All right, let's take a moment. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I know we do this every service, but it's what we need to do. Because there may be people in this room that have never made that decision to follow Christ. And if you haven't done that, if you're not sure if you were to die tonight or this week or this month, if you go to heaven, I'm, I'm speaking to you. And I want to encourage you to look into your heart and ask yourself this question. Do I have a relationship with Jesus? And if I don't, then today would be a great day to make that decision. And here's what we do in this church. We never invite people forward or call them out. We never ask them to say things publicly. But with every head bowed, with every eye closed, if you'd like to invite Jesus into your life today and know you're on your way to heaven, I want you to just slip up your hand. I'm not calling you forward. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Anybody else want to join these folks? Thank you. All right, fantastic. Anybody else? Yeah, a good number of people today are saying yes to this. And maybe you didn't raise your hand and you should have, but I really encourage you to pray with us if you've never said this prayer before. But because we don't single people out, we all do it together. So let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, I thank you for the work of the cross. I thank you that you died for my sins. And you rose again on the third day. And you forever live to be my Lord. And I thank you today. I'm a Christian. And I'm on my way to heaven. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Now, I want to do one more thing before we dismiss. I want to ask you to close your eyes again, if you would. Because I know in this room there are people that I was, as I was talking about this, talking about things getting worse before they get better, talking about when the tough gets going. Some of you are thinking, that's where I am. The tough has just got going. And, and you're telling me things might get worse? Well, they might, but they're going to get better. And if you're here today and you're in tough, you're one of these people, you're in tough, you're in the midst of this, I was talking to you, all service. If that's you, nobody's looking around. I want to pray for you. I want you to raise your hand. If that's you, you're in the midst of it. Maybe it's financial, maybe it's relational, maybe it's a health issue. You're in tough today. There's a lot of hands in the room. I'm going to just pray for you and join in on this just in your heart. Father, I pray for these people. And I pray, Father, that this is not just another sermon. I pray, Father, that they would take this and they would embody it. And they would say, I can do this. I can embrace this adversity and I can ride through it and I can come through to the other side as I exercise patience and I engage my faith and I will see God bring me through it because many are my afflictions, but the Lord will deliver me from them all. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's give the Lord another shout.